Why come ye hither, red coat? Your mind what madness fills? In our valleys there is danger, and there's danger on our hills. Oh, hear ye not the singing of the bugle wild and free. And soon you'll know the ringing of the rifle from the tree. Oh, the rifles, the rifle. In our hands they'll prove no to rifle. Wake up! The British are coming! To arms! The regulars are marching! Wake up! Wake up! How do you awaken a motley collection Wake of colors? Wake up! Colleagues? The British are coming! How do you convince New England merchants, Virginia Wake farmers, Philadelphia up. craftsmen to wake up, wake recognize up. The their common grievances, wake and up. fight for their common rights? What do you say to stir two million of the king's subjects to a fight for freedom? What do you say, Mr. Sam Adams, lately the host of a certain tea party? If I am to have a master, let me have a severe one. I shall then be constantly disposed to take the first fair opportunity of ridding myself of his tyranny. The Boston Tea Party. Sam Adams replied to the tea tax. But what of a dozen other trade restrictions? These two have gone before Paul Revere and William Dawes to ride throughout the countryside and arouse the people of all classes. And now, with the dawn, the Redcoats are marching. But what say you to this marching men of New England? Where will you take your stand? On the bridge at Concord or on the village green at Lexington? Stand your ground, men. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. And here it does begin. With a shot, heard round the world. But heard nowhere with more enthusiasm than in certain capitals of Europe, where England's enemies unite as they wait to see if the uprising will blossom into a revolution, the revolution into a war, and the war into the defeat of an empire that is threatening to engulf the world. And in London, King George III, the die is cast. The colonies must either triumph or submit. But the die is not yet cast. For in Philadelphia, where the Second Continental Congress is meeting in Independence Hall, there are still those who are not aware that they have common cause with the Minutemen. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. But events will not wait upon the outcome of a debate. And with a heroic resistance of Bunker Hill, the American intention gradually takes shape. And a war which has been confined to a single city in its neighboring towns now spreads out to cross the New England hills to a wilderness stronghold, Fort Ticonderoga. The British garrison sleeps, confident in its possession of this key to the Hudson River Valley. But a certain daring band of Vermont farmers do not sleep tonight. They call themselves the Green Mountain Boys. Their leader, Ethan Allen. And so forth men and guns fall to Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. This is the spirit the revolution wants. If only there were a general to weld these isolated, restless troops into a unified, disciplined army. A planter and one-time surveyor, a leader of men who knows a thing or two about the way the British go to war and has a plan. To relieve the burden on New England by attacking the enemy on his home ground, and so an expedition is outfitted, as well as the Second Continental Congress can do so, and sent toward the British stronghold in Canada. 
Meanwhile, from Dorchester Heights above Boston, the big guns of Ticonderoga now look down upon British troops, for Washington has besieged Lord Howe. To the British commander, it's an opportunity to escape. The entire British army evacuates Boston, and New England is temporarily relieved. But victory is soon followed with defeat. Weakened by extreme cold and the long wilderness march, Arnold's forces arrive at Quebec and are thoroughly beaten by the well-fortified British. The news of hard defeat travels to Philadelphia and sharpens the issue. Whether or not the hour has come to break with the mother country. To some, like Tom Paine, everything that is right or reasonable pleads for separation. It is time to part. June 1776. A man from Virginia rises in the Congress. All ears are intent. Resolved that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one Now, with Thomas Jefferson's words, the die is cast. An independence is declared throughout the land. But to the inhabitants thereof, it looks as though liberty is going to be as short-lived as the term of a Connecticut militiaman, for the little American army is collapsing. Collapsing as the British drive Washington away from the Hudson River, defeating his troops at every encounter. Long Island, Brooklyn, Harlem Heights, White Plains, and driving them in exhaustion behind the Delaware River. Now every night finds more men gone and finds the general spirits lower. Many an uneasy hour when all about me are wrapped in sleep. Few people know the predicament we're in and few will know if any disaster happens to their lines, from what cause it flows. Christmas, 1776. But across the river in Trenton, <laughs> the Hessians, mercenaries in the service of the British, celebrate the holiday. But if these drunken mercenaries could be surprised, of the Hessians convinces the British to return to the mouth of the Hudson and refreshes Washington's army as it bivouacs for the winter. But the severe New Jersey winter is enough to make the memory of a single victory fade, for memory will not keep a man warm or give buying power to the worthless Continentals with which he is paid. There is, of course, a paper the troops could read, a crisis paper, written by an Englishman whose loyalty is to the American cause. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But the Green Mountain Boys are busy again blocking the path of General John Burgoyne, Gentleman Johnny, more poet than soldier, who has set off down the Hudson River Valley in an attempt to join forces with Lord Howe and seal off New England from the other colonies. But Burgoyne is suddenly stopped in his tracks. 
by Nicholas Herkimer at Oriskany, by John Stark at Bennington, held to the Hudson River Valley by American guerrilla tactics, waiting for help from Lord Howe. But Lord Howe, evacuating New York by sea, has gone south for the winter. Now let all New England turn out and crush Burgoyne. And all New England does turn out, as 12,000 men under Horatio Gates surround Burgoyne at Saratoga, New York. Finally, the British general, his best troops picked off by Yankee snipers, surrenders his entire command. The threat to New England is now gone, but another threat is not so easily parried. For Washington has gone in pursuit of Howe and engaged upon a campaign that has cost him dearly in men, in supplies, and in the spirit to go on. Valley Forge, the winter of 77. Eins, zwei, one, two, company. The Baron von Steuben, a hard Prussian taskmaster for untrained Americans, has taken an interest in this strange revolution. One, two, one, two. Others have taken an interest. The French consent to Benjamin Franklin's proposal for an alliance. But at Washington's Valley Forge headquarters, there is a new concern. A certain General Cornwallis has appeared off Charleston, South Carolina, calling forth the support of thousands still loyal to the King of England. But unorganized bands of backwoodsmen harass his army delaying his attempt to row up the colonies from the south, pursuing him all the way into Virginia. Meanwhile, Washington must protect the Hudson. But despite an important victory at Monmouth, New Jersey, he arrives at White Plains, New York, with little to hope for in the way of final victory. The French have not yet been heard from. But late in 1780, a highly placed courier, a young Frenchman who has caught the significance of what has gone on in America, comes by night to Washington's headquarters. The Marquis de Lafayette to see General Washington. The Marquis de Lafayette, with affairs of utmost importance to communicate to the general. Une flotte de 40 vaisseaux et une armée de 6,000 hommes. A fleet of 40 ships and an army of 6,000 men. Now, for the first time, George Washington, who has led a few thousand ragged men through six long years of war, will command an army. 1781, a large force of American and French troops heads southward. A strong French fleet is headed for Chesapeake Bay. Green is up from the south. Lafayette is in Virginia when Steuben and Mad Anthony Wayne are standing by. Virginia. Everything points to Virginia and Cornwallis. A brief stop at a place General Washington calls home, then back to the march. The decision must come now or never. Wallace has moved out on a narrow peninsula. There's a chance he may get away by sea, but he fears that Yorktown is a defensive post, which is forever liable to become a prey to a foreign enemy with a temporary superiority at sea. The French, under Admiral de Grasse, now have that superiority at sea, and Cornwallis pleads for help. If you cannot relieve me soon, you must be prepared to hear the worst. Yorktown, October 19th, 1781. Cornwallis surrenders to Washington. And though the Treaty of Peace is to take two years to come, the colonists are all awake now awake to their common responsibility, the responsibility of forging a nation. Not, it is hoped, an ordinary nation, but a broad place, a special place, a place where an idea can take refuge. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Oh, receive the fugitive. 
and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. For from a world of tyrants beside this western sea will form a new dominion, a land of liberty.